Radio Algeria International presents International Policy Code, a weekly program hosted by Lesfer Mazari. Islamic finance has gained prominence across the world. Other key sectors of the Islamic economy have experienced success too. The last decade has seen a sharp rise in Islamic banking services, which are starting to offer a real and attractive alternative to the sort of financial services most people have grown used to. Across the Middle East, Africa and Asia, Islamic finance has grown to become a prominent means of financial management, while it is also emerging in Western economies that have not typically been associated with in the past. Our guest in the program this week is Mr. Mohammed Amin, Islamic finance consultant and UK head of Islamic finance for PricewaterhouseCoopers. He regularly writes about finance. Mohammed Amin, welcome to our program. Good afternoon. Well, what definition would you give to Islamic finance? Islamic finance is carrying out financial transactions without breaking various rules laid down by Islamic scholars for activities that they say are prohibited to Muslims. Mm -hmm. For example, in four places, the Quran prohibits something which in Arabic is called riba. And that is understood by most Islamic scholars to mean any charging or paying of interest. There are also other kinds of transactions that are prohibited, transactions that involve excessive levels of uncertainty, something called bara in Arabic, transactions that involve selling things that you do not already own, which prohibits short selling, which is something that is carried on in conventional mm -hmm. share trading. So Islamic finance is finance conducted in accordance with the rules of Islam as interpreted by Sharia scholars who are particularly expert on both Sharia and on finance. Mr. Amin, where and when did they first apply this financial system? Modern Islamic finance started in the 1960s in Egypt okay. with two very small Islamic banks, which unfortunately did not survive. That was very early. But gradually through the 1970s it spread, and from the 1980s onwards, it has been growing steadily, originally from a very small base, but has been growing steadily, particularly in Malaysia, in Gulf, and in many other Muslim-majority countries. And more recently, it's been growing in uh, what I would call Western countries, mm -hmm. uh, because places like London are global centers for, for finance of all kinds. What is the difference between Islamic finance and nowadays finance? Is there any difference? The difference between Islamic finance and what you call nowadays finance, or what I and most other specialists call conventional finance, mm -hmm. is that Islamic finance and conventional finance basically achieve similar objectives. They take money from people who have extra savings and supply that money to people who need money for either business purposes to expand the business or for personal purposes, such as to buy residential property. The difference between conventional finance and Islamic finance is that the transactions used in conventional finance normally involve the receipt or payment of interest, whereas mm -hmm. conventional finance sets out to achieve those similar financial goals, but without any charging or paying of interest. And I can give you examples if yeah. you want. Yes, uh, Mr. Amin. Okay, let me give you one very simple example, which I always use to explain the difference. Mm -hmm. If you want a car which costs $10,000, mm -hmm. you might go to a conventional bank which say, and say, lend me $10,000 for one year to buy this car. Yes. And the conventional bank says, that's okay, you need to pay us back $12,000 over, mm -hmm. say, one year. Mm -hmm. That's a 20% rate of interest, but it, it, it allows me to explain the example very simply. Yes. So now you've borrowed $10,000, you buy your car, and you pay $1,000 back to the bank every month for 12 months. You pay the bank $12,000, so you've repaid your $10,000 loan and $2,000 of interest. Uh, that's and for, Islamic that's, Bank yeah, that's will for... not carry out that transaction because yeah. the Islamic Bank will not charge you interest. 
Mm-hmm. What an Islamic bank will do instead is to ask you, what kind of car do you want? And you say, I want a four-wheel drive. Mm-hmm. The bank will purchase that car for you from the car dealer, and it will then sell that car to you, not to $10,000. The bank will say, to you, the price of this car sold by the bank is $12,000. Mm -hmm. And you can pay us the $12,000 immediately if you wish, or we will let you pay the $12,000 to us over 12 months at $1,000 per month. You will then pay the bank $1,000 per month for the Mm -hmm. car that you bought for $12,000. At the end of one year, you've paid the bank $12,000. You have not paid the bank any interest. What you have done is buy from the bank a car for $12,000, which the car dealer would have sold you for $10,000. This transaction I'm describing is called a Murabaha transaction in Arabic. Mm. And it's one of the common transactions used in Islamic finance. So you can see that Islamic finance, conventional finance, both achieve the same objective here, which is to allow you to acquire a car which you don't pay for all of it on day one. Mm -hmm. The, The economics are the same, but the transactions are completely different. What are the benefits? of Islamic finance? The benefits of Islamic finance are that it brings people into the financial system who otherwise would not be in the financial system. If you have a devout Muslim who believes that it is religiously wrong to put money into a bank and receive interest, Mm -hmm. he will not put money into the bank. He will keep it in cash at home. And if he keeps it in cash at home, that money is not part of the financial system. It's no use to somebody else who needs money. Generally, if you have somebody who is not willing to borrow money from a bank to purchase a house, for example, or to expand his business because he believes that it's religiously wrong to pay interest to a bank, if an Islamic bank will provide finance to him to buy his house or to expand his business, that's a transaction that can take place which otherwise would not happen because the person would not do the transaction for religious reasons. So... Islamic finance brings more people into the financial system, and for developing economies, it's very important to have as many people taking Mm -hmm. part in the financial system as possible. Exactly the same principle applies with insurance. I think it's a major tragedy if somebody dies and he has no life insurance, and the reason he has no life insurance is because he believes that conventional life insurance is religiously wrong. There's a transaction called the castle which I won't explain now, but the castle is a way of doing the same thing that insurance does, but in a way that Islamic scholars say is religiously acceptable. So Mm -hmm. that way you can have people who have the protection that the castle brings, which is similar to the protection that conventional insurance brings, who otherwise would not have it at all. You have people right now who are Muslims who will not insure their house against burning down from fire, because they say insurance is religiously prohibited. If a Takafu contract gives them the same benefits that a conventional house fire insurance contract gives them, I regard that as a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Amin, uh, what would be the repercussions on the economy? And how would you expect the market's reaction if adopted by uh, Westerners? First of all, the repercussions for the economy are, in my view, always good because you're allowing the financial system to expand, mm-hmm. to have more people taking part in the financial system, more people are able to have their savings put to good use, more people are able to obtain finance who otherwise would not obtain finance. Its use in Western countries is primarily a for Muslims living in those countries who otherwise might not take part in the financial system in these Western countries. And secondly, uh, many many large conventional banks in centers like London undertake Islamic finance transactions for businesses in Muslim-majority countries simply as a way of expanding their overall international business. Which countries apply this financial system? This this financial system is compulsory in two countries that I know of, Iran and Sudan. In both Iran and Sudan, it's against the law to operate a conventional bank. All banking in Iran is carried out in accordance with Islamic finance principles, and conventional banking is not allowed in Iran. And the same is true of Sudan. I'm not aware of any other countries that require Islamic finance by law. However... Many countries, especially Muslim-majority countries like Malaysia, Bahrain, 
the UAE, they have very strong Islamic finance sectors. In countries like Malaysia, there is a lot of government encouragement of Islamic finance. They, those countries have worked hard to bring about favorable tax rules. Sometimes there are subsidies. So it's growing strongly in many Muslim-majority countries. And my experience is that more and more Muslim-majority countries mm. are changing their tax systems to enable Islamic finance to take place. Because otherwise, if sometimes the tax system can make it too difficult to do an Islamic finance transaction. If we go back to the example I gave you of the car, yeah. that car for an Islamic finance transaction is sold twice. It's sold by the car dealer to the bank, and then it is sold by the bank to the customer. And mm -hmm. if the country expo has a sales tax, which gets charged twice, that makes the Islamic finance transaction much more expensive than a conventional transaction where the sale only happens once. So okay. countries that want to promote Islamic finance, they need to put a lot of effort into looking at their tax laws to ensure that their tax laws are not acting as a barrier to Islamic finance. And that actually is one of my areas of speciality. Mr. Amin, what do financiers and conventional bankers say about it? Do they expect it to be uh, long-lasting? Yes. Uh, everybody expects Islamic finance to be long long-lasting and to be a permanent feature of the global financial landscape. At the moment, globally, it's still relatively small. Mm -hmm. I looked up the total assets of all of the Islamic banks in the world, and when you add them together, mm -hmm. they are about half a percent of total financial assets. So it's still a very small part of the, of the global economy, but in some countries now, like Bahrain, like Malaysia, it's a sizable percentage of banking in those countries. I think last time I looked in, in Malaysia, it was about 25% of all banking in Malaysia was Islamic. So mm -hmm. it's a sector that I think will continue to grow. It will always be, uh, I think it will always be around. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will replace conventional finance, except in those countries like Iran, where the government makes conventional finance illegal. Mr. Amin, has there been a historical evolution of Islamic finance? Yes. Uh, I mentioned that it started in the 1960s with some small uh, Islamic banks. Uh, the range of Islamic finance products that are available has been growing steadily. For example, in the early 1980s, they developed the concept of the kafal, which is an Islamic equivalent of insurance. Mm -hmm. The Sukuk, which is an Islamic equivalent of conventional bonds that can be bought and sold on a stock exchange. Sukuk yes. was only developed in the late 1990s, early 2000s in Malaysia, although it's now become a very important part of the Islamic finance system. So gradually, the range of products available in Islamic finance has been expanding. And how would you describe today's Islamic finance? I think it's still a very young industry, it's a rapidly growing industry, mm -hmm. and it's an industry which has great potential importance for Muslim-majority countries because it can allow those countries to increase participation in the financial system. Mr. Amin, a last question. What would be the challenges for Islamic finance? The, the challenges for Islamic finance are twofold. First of all, there are still many parts of the conventional financial system that don't have an equivalent in Islamic finance. One of the areas that interests me particularly is pensions policy. And I'm not aware of Islamic financial companies selling products called equivalent to annuities. Yes. An annuity is a contract where you take money and hand it over to a company like an insurance company, mm -hmm. and they agree to pay you a fixed amount of money every year until you die, and then it stops. Okay. Now, and that is often used for people who retire, who want a pension, don't know how long they're going to live. So they want a pension that is guaranteed to run for the rest of their lives. And it, if the private sector is going to offer pensions, you need a private sector product like annuities. And at the moment, I'm not aware of a solution for a, an Islamic finance approved annuity contract. Uh, similarly, certain kinds of derivatives which are used in conventional finance, I think are not yet available in Islamic finance. Mm -hmm. And 
while derivatives have a very bad name, they are associated with some of the problems of the global financial crisis, yes. derivatives in conventional finance were developed for very good business reasons and meet real business needs. So to the extent that Islamic finance does not have equivalent products, I think that is, that, that is something lacking and something that needs to be developed. Mr. Mohammed Amin, Islamic finance consultant and UK head of Islamic finance for PricewaterhouseCoopers, thank you for being with us.